What are we missing? Microphone. Sorry, that was residue from last night because I turned down your microphone when we went dead. So <laughs> go for it, man. Wow, we're having a rough time. We're on. All right. Hey, nice of you to show up again. I'm going to start that all over again. <laughs> so I don't know where you went last night, but you got to work and get that computer fixed. It's something wrong with that. You, I don't know what it is. Actually, we want to thank you all for hanging in there with us. It was a weird night. We don't know what was going on. I uh, looked back at the video myself, which I almost never do at the end, and I saw how I was pixelating, and I thought I was transporting on Star Trek or something like that. <laughs> but I did. I transported back, and I'm glad you did too. And you're here for a special Shop Night Live on Friday night. So thanks for hanging out. But I'm glad to have you here in the shop again. And we want to continue on our top 10 tools list where I got rudely interrupted. And, but before we get into that, I want, because you showed up for this special edition, I'm going to let you in on an inside offering that we're going to have here at Epic Woodworking before the mailer goes out tomorrow morning. We're sending out a mailer to the mailing list to tell everyone that we have, we have a lot of pieces that are in process, and I did list these prior before, for sale. And so if you want to apply your new hand tool skills on some pieces that I've already gotten down the road a fair bit and you could have these ready as a Christmas gift to someone special or yourself to have in your home or whatever they are going to be available and we have cut the prices again on the things that did not sell the last time so this is not something that we do a lot this it's as long as they last so as I'm teaching projects and different um, techniques and things to make over the over these months even ahead I will now and then make something available but when it's gone it's gone I'm not making more <laughs> so go ahead and you can if they're already posted so you get first dibs on and or check out those low low prices I mean think about it when you're looking at them you're getting the cost the value of the raw materials plus all the machining and, and process that they've already been brought through. So they all have a little bit of a video description and all the parts and pieces. And a lot of it's solid cherry, and quite a number of them are pieces from the TV show. And there's a couple pieces that are complete, finished, and signed by me that are lower than we've ever offered them. So have at it. But don't lose your focus for tonight. <laughs> yes. Right. And those of you who pre... The online course for the piece and a half hour consult with you, plus the plans. Okay. Yes, that's true. It comes with the plans, the access to the video if we have a companion video, and yeah, the half hour consult. Now, those of you who have already bought, you still... So, a few of you still have your consult coming, so we got to get together on that. You can you can notify me, but I have not forgotten um, the time when you picked it up and we talked didn't count. That reminds me, we are not like shipping these things all over the place. You have to cover the shipping or picking them up. I'd rather you pick them up because some of them are, you know, 
it can get expensive to ship things. You know, it's like 400 bucks almost anywhere to the Midwest and down south. So anyway, check them out. Hopefully you find something you like there. It'll help us to clear out some things and be building new projects. Yeah, so that are coming up. All right. Well, let's pick it up where we left off. I believe I began to pixelate when I was putting the bevel gauge away. So I'm not going to go over the bevel gauge again unless somebody says they missed that. I, I think that's where we left off. Um, I, I did use this chinois, and I think I talked about flea markets already, like getting beauties like this one with the brass fittings, the thumb tightening. And it's nice. You can, you can pick up a lot of these tools at flea markets. Now, I want to move into chisels. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about chisels because we made a special video on that, all about chisels and um, buying and whatever. But I do want to show you these chisels are definitely some of my favorite. I use them a lot. I was using them today for several hours um, chopping some dovetails. And these, this style here are standard bench chisels. So they're average length. And there are different types, like, like these guys here are cute little chisels. And they fit nicely into the palm of your hand, so you can hold them this way. Also, when you hold them by the chisel, you can use a mallet. And because they're so short, you have a great amount of control. They call these butt chisels, but I don't know why. Does anyone know why? They're cute, but once again, no idea. <laughs> They're just little butt chisels. No sophomore jokes now. All right, so um, I'm going to put my butt chisels in the box. OK, and this chisel, <laughs> I'm just going to talk about this is a, also a nice, I'm not talking, this does not count as one of the favorite tools, but this is a pairing chisel. And I'm just noting it for it's different. It's long, and it has a flexible blade on it so that you can actually register it off of a surface, and you can pull the handle up slightly while the, the actual um, iron is flat on the table, and you're getting an ac absolute flush feeling with it. And you can pair dead flush with a surface using that flex characteristic of the pairing chisel. It's really nice to have in certain situations. But I want to talk about the bench chisels, the standard ones. These are nice average length. They're, you can pair with them. You can do certain type of carving operations with them. And you can, of course, chop and clean out mortises, um, chop dovetail parts, all kinds of joinery, little detailing you do with the everyday bench chisels. I use them a lot. Now, I, I've gotten a lot of questions. What kind of chisels should I get? How much should I spend on chisels? And that's really a subjective question. I'll just tell you that when I started out, I did not buy ex chisels like this. These are expensive. These, you get a set of five, and I think it's $300. So you're getting the quality of the steel in that. These are the Veritas PM V11s. Um, anyway, really nice steel, takes an edge beautifully, and holds an edge for a long time. It's the quality of the steel that it can hold the edge, stay sharp for a good long time. Now, you don't need that, because you want to learn to sharpen anyway when you're starting out. So you don't <laughs> But you don't want them dulling really fast. My first set of chisels was this. This is one of the set. They are marples, and I got six in the set for $49. But that was 30 years ago, so <laughs> maybe more than that. Uh, more than that. And, but I loved them, and I used them for a long time. And they would, you can tune them up nicely. The, the steel was not quite as hard. It didn't hold the edge as long, but it, it held the edge beautifully. I cut a lot of dovetails with these things, and 
they work beautifully. Um, but you do have to tune them up. They didn't hold it that long. My next set I went to were these Sorbies. And they have rosewood handles, a brass ferrule. So one thing I forgot to mention about bench chisels is you can pair them, but they're also designed to take a mallet strike so that you can smash on them. Like some, like carving chisels, you can do that as well, but they're geared for kind of hard use if you need to. But um, these Sorbies, I really loved them when I got them. They had a higher grade steel. They were more expensive, but they still weren't top, top of the line. And they fit my hand great and all that. And then I won these uh, Swiss made at a furniture thing once and back in uh, 10 years ago. Yeah, I won these and I loved them. And they, these were Swiss made. These are available at Woodcraft. Beautiful feel. They have the octagonal handle and they hold an edge nicely. The steel's of the same kind of grade. I'm not going to get into the different steels. You can watch the video if you want to uh, get into that. And other people have done videos on chisels too. So these wonderful, beautiful steel, I love them for a while until um, Veritas gave uh, me these chisels for as part of um, the show. Like when we were doing the show, they wanted to feature their chisels. And at first I was like, well, I don't know. I don't want to get rid of my Swiss made chisels. I kind of like them. And I got nice pockets for them already here. And I had six of the Swiss made in the set. The Veritas came in a set of five. So that's why you have this one kind of lone five eighths. <laughs> this is what you get in the Veritas set. But, um, you know, I really, these grew on me pretty fast and I really love them. But it's a luxury if you, if you want this experience, by all means, get them if you're ready. I, I like to go through some first, but if you're going to eventually get here, why not just get one set? And not because by the time you buy all the chisels, you know, and I'm sure the resale value would be high on them as well. So those are my favorite chisels now. And if you're thinking of any questions, let's bring them up. But next, my next favorite tool in here is my combination square. And I've talked about this a few times about how good it is to have a nice quality combination square. This one's by Sterrett. It works really well. It's very smooth operating. It tightens down. It's absolutely square when you get it. Um, we do have a link to this, I believe, right? Yep. And um, when I bought this one new, it was like $64. And at that time, that was a lot to pay for a square. And I have used this so much, probably nearly daily. Right, so um, it's really important to know square. We talked about that a lot when we were doing our hip to be square. Uh, now I have wooden squares. <laughs> That's a video from a few weeks ago. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, it's worth the stop to find it. Right, and we talked about that and the, the uh, three cut method, making a cross cut sled, knowing your square. Some of you know your square, or some don't. And really, you might want to ask that person in your life, am I square? Well, the truth hurts sometimes. No, it's OK to be square, because squares make the world go around. <laughs> hey, Tom, the uh, Swiss chisels, is it called Swiss made? Um, is that the name of them? Or? I think so, yeah. Yeah, Swiss made. Okay. They're also, if you buy them in Switzerland, they're feel like P, P-H-I-E-L, I think. Yes, that's what Glenn said here. Yeah, but they're Swiss made. This is, um, I'm, as, I'm pretty sure Woodcraft still carries the whole Swiss made line. I haven't been there for a little while, but uh, they're pretty nice too. So the combination square, it's really great in a lot of situations. You know, you have adjustments, you can set depths, 
You can use it to, to um, parallel lines, uh, square up fences, make sure, just all around check that you're square. You will never regret having bought a good one because if it's not absolutely square, it's so frustrating and, you know, you end up, it's, it's, I often compare it to a builder needs an accurate level. Um, a furniture maker needs an accurate square because you need to know that as a reference point for many things you build. Um, so getting a good one is well worth it. Um, I'll jump to the other one. This is one of my bonus tools, but these little guys, it's the little baby brother of the Sterrett Square. It's the four inch double end square. Now you can also get the six inch, doesn't matter. I just like this four because it's so small. It actually is perfect and lightweight. And what? You can hold it still for a little bit. Oh, I thought I was yelling again. No. <laughs> Here you go. you're yelling. <laughs> I'm yelling. Okay, I'm hold. I'm, I wasn't holding it still. All right, so this is it. <laughs> what? What is this brand? I. This is where I got stumped last time. This is the one that they have at Woodcraft. If someone can inform us what the brand is they currently have, you're going to be surprised that these are not cheap. But you will love having these. But the basic fundamental one you want to have first is the uh, combination square. Um, these are sweet the way they adjust, and they're really smooth with the adjustment. We have links as well, right, to eye, is it eye gauging is the other one? <clears throat> so the eye gauging. And the crown. I, think those were I don't think it's a crown. No, okay. no, you're thinking of something different. Okay. The bevel gauge. Sorry. The double end. I don't know if we linked to the Woodcraft version, this one, but the eye gauging is an import, and I think you get the four and the six in the set, and it's really inexpensive, and there's a reason for that. <laughs> Everyone I know has a, They're a little rough in the operating. As far as I know, they're pretty square. A number of students have shown up to classes with them. So you can get the eye gauging, but you're not going to enjoy that feedback experience of a really nice tool. That's the one thing. When you do buy nice tools, there's something intrinsic to them that it's hard to explain. It's, it's the reinforcement of having a beautiful um, tool or machine or, you know, there's this feedback that you get from just handling it that, wow, this is really fine and it makes you feel fine. It makes you want to do fine work. You know, it's this feedback loop where you know what it's like when you pick up a junky square or something, and every time you're like frustrated inside because you go, oh, this isn't really probably square. Let me check it again. And you're frustrated. It's, it's like you're, you're hassled with your stuff. And you, you know what? Maybe you want to keep those because you can always blame your tools when things don't come up. That's what they say. <laughs> So you should have a few bad ones around so you can blame them too. Never know you to do that. <laughs> no, you can. I should make special honorable mention to the ones that woodpeckers have sent me. I love these. These are not adjustable squares, but they're set squares. These are sweet. Their whole line of squares are really exceptional. They're not cheap either. But it, again, it's that feedback loop. This one comes with all these indexing slots that you can put a pencil in and drag and get that distance referencing dead on. I mean, what I love is how accurate all these are. And again, it's that kind of feedback of, this is accurate. This is, I know, I know I'm good right here. <laughs> so I'm really into their tools. And I did mention those square, the, the hook rules last night. Those things are awesome. Yeah, a couple awesome. people said they went out and purchased yeah, them. Yeah, already purchased them. Um, yeah, you know they're what, pretty Pam, inexpensive. Would you pull down that one with the indexing? Because I, I can only get a, I should probably get a down view get of that. Get it down? Because just to explain what you were talking about, I couldn't see. Uh, just those little slots. You can put a pencil in the little 
impression there and use it as a guide. So like um, if we were to use a board like this, I could get my pencil right in and say, okay, that's three quarters of an inch and drag it down. And that distance right there, if I check it with my hook rule, look at that, right on three quarters of an inch. So you know you're accurate with this setup. I just wanted to see what you were explaining there. Yeah. Okay. So the next two um, beyond the um, combination square, the thing I use a lot are these marking gauges. Now this one, this one is one I got at a flea market years ago. Beautiful rosewood, worn, had all the brass fittings and inlays. This is the kind of thing you can find. And it has a nice marking edge, but I dulled it. I've used it so much. I actually got a bunch for classes and I use these more often these days for when I'm cutting dovetails and things like that. Now, these are pretty nice because they have an actual knife edge in here that, whereas some like that one have a round pin. Now, you don't want the round pin marking gauges because they, when they drag across the grain, they're okay on end grain, but a lot of times you're marking across the grain, like on this drawer. This is one of the things I've been working on. So when you're dragging across, you're scoring across the fibers. And when you're, if you're scoring across the fibers, a pin, the pin type, drag across and they tear it up. You don't get a crisp, nice line like that. That's, you want a slicing edge. So I don't know if you can see in here, but it's actually a beveled knife edge. So this type of uh, marking gauge is very common. <clears throat> and by loosening this, you can slide the fence out and change the distance. Right now, this one's set up. I got it designated because I have several going right now for drawer parts, and it's set to be just right, just a little thicker than this stock. So I get all this cut. And once you do that, then on the, I would take this and on the, um, the corresponding end, I would drag that across here and then I dragged it across here. So you're just with one hand, you're getting a super accurate mark. It's, it's an old world tool. They've been around for a long time but it doesn't require you to hold a pencil or a knife on the end of a square like this. The knife is set in the beam here and you adjust the fence to give you a nice accurate thing. And then you get your dovetails to go together like that. So everything fits, everything's aligned, it's offset just right. We've got the same half inch in there and they fit in just right. So the pins are just slightly proud and you get really nice work. Now, you don't have to buy this style. They do make these round type, and I like those too. They feel really good in your hand. They have a round slicing wheel, which is nice, but I'm so used to the knife edge. I just like having that point in that knife. So the marking gauge is a great old world tool. Use it a lot. Really like having that. Now, we had a question from Michelle last night about should I get a shoulder plane? And my comment there was sure, but that is not as high priority a plane as it's not used as much. Unless you're doing a lot of work with, I don't know, fitting tenons in a certain way. But I don't, you, I don't have to go, I, go for it that often. So one of the nice features of a shoulder plane is that the blade comes all the way to the edge. It is nice to have a plane that does that, but there are others you can have that also will do that. Um, this can go into dados, like this is a three quarter inch one, the Stanley 92. Um, but they're really nice. They're, they're kind of elegant old tools uh, to have, so it's nice to have one 
But I would say if you're just building your set, the more priority would be to have a really sweet block plane. This is my next favorite tool. This is the Lee Nielsen low angle block plane. It's a 12 degree blade. It is, I always forget the number, the 60 and one half. They have um, another version of this where, see this one, the blade is captured in there and you've got about 3 sixteenths of an inch on each side of the blade. So it doesn't go all the way to the edge. But they do make um, what they call a rabbiting block plane. It's almost identical to this, but it's open on the side and the blade does go all the way to the edge. So if you had that kind of need, those can also be used as shoulder planes. So, but I do love having this one because it has this adjustable mouth which allows you to dial it in and it feels so good in your hand. It's, it's the right width, that nice old like uh, brass ball of a handle there gets burnished over time. It comes, it's really beautiful and shiny. I could shine it up a little I suppose. You know you can always clean your tools with uh, steel wool. Let me see if I can bring that back a little bit. Yeah, look at that. So it's starting to shine back. And this is the old kind of burnish. Now that I've done that, I better go ahead and get the rest of it or it's going to look <laughs> funny. <laughs> but you can clean up your tools. I've just took off that old patina. And, but when you get it, it's so sweet. But the, the way it feels in your hand is really great. It's your, thumbs, your thumb and middle finger go on the, these little impressions. And then your index finger will rest right here. And it becomes part, almost part of your hand, like to create chamfers. And let me just show you how it feels and works here. You can, you can set it to do beautiful, fine work. Like I was just working on a piece where I had to bring these pieces into plane. And I was able to dial it in. And I sharpened it up to create a shaving like this. I mean, this is a single... Look how it's translucent. It's really thin and wispy. You've got super control and it's such a thin adjustment. So it gives you tremendous control and adjustment. You know, you're taking off these micro shavings and there's so many cases where this is really useful. And again, it's that, it's that feedback of a great tool you know, using a beautiful, beautifully made tool like this. The 60 and a half. Now, I think they're, they're not cheap either. I think they're around 165 now, something like that. But it's one of those everyday use, love, and it looks great in the cabinet too. <laughs> now, I also keep the Stanley, uh, just a cheap, you know, you can get these on the online. And... I've often mentioned I'll keep my Lee Nielsen set more finely to do precision work like this where the, the uh, Stanley I usually keep it set heavier so I don't have to keep readjusting the other one moving it in and out and if you want to cut chamfers you know you're just holding it on an angle to create a little faceted edge you could create a little um, beaded or soft round over on a on a tabletop or the top of a chest or any kind of piece and it's really fun to use these because they're they get it done quickly but then when I go get close to the real refined work I will use the Lee Nielsen so that is definitely a top 10 tool the Lee Nielsen block plane uh, they, there are others that are made, um, there's one very much like it, it looks a lot like it, I forget the brand name, somebody probably knows. It's just chunkier though, I've tried them, I've had it in my hand, I don't know, they, made, they designed it, it's a little wider, and just because of that wideness, it doesn't feel as good like in the use to me, and I've got big hands and it feels too clunky to me so 
I can't imagine um, using it, you know, recommending it. I've got a question from Donald. What would you use a skew block plane for? Um, a lot of times those are used for shearing end grain. <coughs> Again, a skew block plane, if you're going to do like, like if you do a lot of picture frames and things like that, it's usually used in conjunction with a shooting board or something like that because the skewed angle on the block plane is addressing the wood at that skewed angle. So it's, it's doing more of a shearing cut. So it even improves the quality of the shaving because you're not only at a low angle, at the 12 degree low angle, but you're at an angle to addressing the cut. So it's almost like, for lack of thinking of a better visual, like a guillotine blade, right? <laughs> and it's set very fine, like that Lee Nielsen. But rather than coming in dead perpendicular to the workpiece, you're coming in at an angle. And you're at 12 degrees on, and when you're working on end grain, that gives you, you will get shavings like this on end grain. Beautiful, beautiful control, you know, with a, but again, those shooting boards can be used with straight edge tools as well. Whenever you start to get into like that more eccentric version of tool where the skewed or even like the shoulder beyond a regular plane, you're, you're getting into a more specialized application. So those are fine, they're valuable, but I, I just want to address first the fundamental building blocks of a great tool cabinet, you know, for hand tools. So yeah, I that's would... That's what Michelle was asking, progressive purchase kind of... Idea. Exactly, yeah. There are, uh, there's nothing wrong with them, but they are, you're not going to use them as much. So get the ones that really can do a lot for you. All right, hope that answered that question. So my next favorite tool is the spoke shave. This is one of my favorite tools of all time for the way it works not necessarily the type, but the one I have here, I get asked a lot, what do you recommend for a spoke shape? I'm really not the best person to ask um, because I haven't tried a whole lot of them. Like I can't say, well, of all these, this is the winner. I've always <laughs> used these old Stanleys that I've gotten from flea markets. And you know, as I've talked to more older makers who've been around doing a lot, a lot of people refer to this as one of the best. So um, I've kept, I used one without adjustment, but this is a Stanley number 151. These are available a lot online. You can pick them up. They got the adjustment knobs. Um, flea markets, if you find them, they're really great versions of a spoke shape. They're kind of like that block plane. They're the fundamental basic model uh, that you use most. It's got a short, flat sole, so it's great for, you no. Know, again, you can use it on material like this, and you pull it toward you, but, you know, it's shaving a spoke. It, it allows you to do uh, free-form sculptural kind of adjustments on pieces. We've, I've used this a lot in videos where we've done curved legs and we clean up the material. Here we're on something straight, but we could work a curve coming in different directions and clean up a radius on, um, on a bandsaw on radius or something like that. Really useful, fun to use too. A great tool to get kids involved in the shop too. So you can set it safely. It's basically like a heavy-duty potato peeler, or vegetable peeler, right? It's, it's got the, you, you get a nice sharp edge and you just set the blade light. And kids love to pull, it's not hard, as long as you keep that sole flat, you can pull and they'll get a shaving, almost like a peel of a vegetable. And these little spiral cuts are cool to see come off. And then they're gonna feel it changing and realize that they're actually sculpting this work to whatever shape they want. 
it's a wonderful tool. It doesn't take a lot of effort to use it. And uh, it can be set quite aggressively to remove material where that wouldn't be a child. But they're awesome tools. This is the 50 one, and I used this for a good while until I got the one with the knobs. I thought this was the best. <laughs> But it's almost identical to the 151, except it doesn't have those adjustment knobs. So when you adjust, you just loosen and you eyeball it and you lock it in. So you don't have the, the simplicity of the adjustment. Now the soles, there are a lot of specialties with these too. So it's nice to get some of those. Uh, this is the straight, this is a, the 52. It's just got straight wings. I'm not sure. It doesn't feel as comfortable. This has more of a goose wing, which feels better in your hand. These are straighter, um, which just is a different feel. I don't, I'm not sure what, in certain cases, your hands would not be able to get in there if, they're, if you were using uh, wings like this or handles. But it's just another version where this is the 51, the 52, just the main difference is the handle shape. This one is the 63, and it has a rounded sole. So this is a specialty tool where you can see it can get into a tighter cove where the other one with the flat sole has a limit to the radius of the inward radius that you can cut. But this is, these are wonderful, fun tools to use. All right? I have some spoke shave questions. Sure. Uh, do you need all different shapes of spoke shaves? I kind of hear you answering that question right there, maybe. Yeah, I was kind of. Uh, no, you don't. Again, it's like start out with the fundamental. This is the, the great basic. I would say one of these two um, with the flat sole. This just gives you the easier adjustment. Now, that's not to say you cannot buy brand new. Lee Nielsen has some amazing spoke shaves. Of course, they're not inexpensive, but they're beautiful tools to use. I think Brian Boggs designed one for them, and he's a, a great chair maker. Um, so I'm sure it's a beautiful, fine tool to use. Uh, but I haven't tried it. Okay, Rick's so. asking, or he says, I get chatter when I use my spoke shave. What causes that, and how do I remedy it? Oh, man. Well, we'll get into the use of it. It's, um, it could be a lot of things. It's, you want to make sure it's sharp, and then you have to make sure it's cleaned up and the blade is laying flat on the plate underneath here, and everything's tight. And you don't want too much of the blade exposed. So, and when I, and, and, it, and then it's part of the use. You're making sure the main thing you're thinking about is just having that little short flat sole flat on there. You don't want to ride it up or down. And if, it, if you're getting some chatter, you can skew it like that. We were talking about the hand plane. And you get a little easier cut. I mean, part of it is applying the appropriate pressure in conjunction with holding it flat and, and depends on how much blade you've got out. I would say you probably are exposing too much blade so that you're trying to do too much. The more blade you have out, the more pressure you have to maintain on the work to get a smooth cut. If you, if you expose a lot of blade and don't give the pressure you get, you, it's going to chatter because it needs more force. So I keep mine set light. I don't want to, most of the time, you know, but you can make them, like I said, more aggressive. So it's more of a setting. Make sure it's sharp. The blade is, is solidly uh, fixed in the mouth and you're not exposing too much skewed technique. All of those things help toward reducing chatter. Uh, we do not have a video on sharpening a spoke shave, but that has come up before. Yeah, I do want to do one. Uh, soon so enough. maybe we should do that soon. Okay, Bob's asking, do you ever use a draw knife, or is that too radical a tool compared to the planes you are showing now? 
No, actually, Bob, I like draw knifing. <laughs> That's another great tool, old tool. I have one here. Um, they're kind of dangerous. I mean, I love using it. It's, well, I'll show it to you since you asked. Um, but this is another one I got at a flea market. When I'm, when I'm doing, um, actually, you believe it or not, when I'm making like Queen Anne legs and things like that, there's a lot of corner material to hog off and it takes, you're either going to use a chisel like upside down or I like using a draw knife when I have a lot of material to remove. I think, did we use this on the shop stool? Yes, that's what David's saying. Oh, awesome. Good, yeah. So I featured this. If you want to go back and watch the shop stool videos, I use this. It actually is quite, it's a lot of fun to use. You don't have the soul you you just have this big knife edge out in space but it works similarly so you you're resting that bevel down on the workpiece and you pull it toward you so look at how much material you're removing so that's what's fun about it you can take you can take a lot of chunks off fast Shitty. yeah but you because you've got two hands on it it's safer than it looks you know, it's what it, you can't, you can't cut your hand as long as they're on the handles. <laughs> Famous last words. <laughs> and your elbows are by your side, so you never really bring it further than that. But isn't that cool? I mean, you can rough out materially fast. And then I would go from this to the spoke shave. It's like refining it. So you're getting big faceted chunks here, then the finer with the spoke shave. This did not make my top 10 tool list because it's a wonderful tool, but I don't use it as often. So it's not in the cabinet. It's in the second string lineup. Um, Bob's asking about your thoughts on sharpening water stones and diamond stones, what grits you use. I'm, I'm thinking we should direct that kind of question to your sharpening, hand plane sharpening and card scraper sharpening videos. Yeah. Which I already set on the part one of this last night's video. They are um, involved in the um, description and also in the end screen there for both of those. Yeah, that's, we could go a whole night in that. We have talked about the different stones and some of the virtues of the stones. But I do use water stones. Um, I think it was the last. That was on Saturday at the Michigan group. Oh, OK, yeah, sorry. The Michigan group. <laughs> saw me have to stop and refresh my chisels on there. I use these Ohishi stones from uh, Lee Nielsen. Right now I'm using those. But I, I do use water stones, just to tell you that. But yeah, um, we've got a few more to get through. Uh, just the rasps. <laughs> I, I always feel weird saying rasps. Um, a P and an S. Wait. SPS should not go together, <laughs> right? Rasps. So these are my primary rasps. Let's say rasp one and rasp two. This is my rasp. Yeah, let's just keep singular. Um, First I've, rasp, second rasp. I've got 49 and 50. I use, the Nis I use a Nicholson rasp, <laughs> <laughs> not the Nis Nicholson rasps. So I've got... The 49 is the more coarse cut, and the 50 is the smooth cut. When I got turned on to these rasps, I could not believe the difference from my prior experience. If you're like me, I remember being a kid in my basement in Lowell, Mass, on the dirt floor, holding one of these types of rasps. And we would just put like hockey tape around the handle. We didn't make a handle for it, just to blunt it and rasp away on pine or whatever. But notice the teeth. They're all in rows. And this is very aggressive. This is a real roughing rasp. And it would do fair work, but leave a very coarse surface. It's almost like 60 or 40 grit sandpaper as compared to these. Now, when I, these are fairly inexpensive compared to these. Um, these are the Nicholson rasps. 
I have heard that the quality has gone down. Someone will have to tell me. I think now they're, I don't know if they were started making them in Mexico. These are made in USA. And something about the recipe got lost. Somebody might be able to comment on these. I don't have the, the new ones. But um, look at those teeth on here. So here's the 49. So what you have is you have random spacing, random placement on the teeth. So you don't have rows. They're just all kind of randomly there. And what that does for you is that it's not like you have a whole row hitting the work at one time. So when you use this rasp, it's very rough. We use this rasp, you get a nice cut, but it's so refined. And it feels like you can really control it. You know, so you could go from that faceted surface we just created with the draw knife and rasp it and it's like beautiful it feels great to use it has a really nice feel to it and all the more because it has this gorgeous handle which we made <laughs> one of our shop nights. Oh, episode long ago. Yeah, and then you go to the 50, and that's even finer. And I use these to death on 18th century legs, you know, where you're sculpting the curves and just beautiful, fast tools. Now, a lot of times I would go from, like the progression might be draw knife, spoke shave, rasp card scraper, sandpaper. I mean, it's sort of that's going down the, the row of refinement. But rasps like this, the random teeth, are really wonderful. There are some very expensive ones out there. I think they still make them, the Aru, Aru? Yep, Fred just mentioned them. Thanks, Fred. Yeah, those are awesome, too. There's probably another brand. Shinto? Yeah. Bill's mentioning. I believe you. <laughs> but you're going to find they're not inexpensive, but they're worth it if you're going to be doing a lot of shaping kind of work, which I have been into over the years. And a lot of enjoyment using a rasp like that because of the freeform nature and control of it. So that's one of my favorite tools. And then um, I've already shown you the double end square. I just have two more. My dovetail saw, which also happens to be from Lee Nielsen. This is a um, 15 tooth per inch, a rip tooth configuration. It just feels so good in your hand. Like you, you're not meant to put all four fingers in there. You're meant to have one out in a line. That's why it's very small. It seems like it's too small for a bigger hand, but it actually fits like a glove in my hand. And I use this to cut all my dovetails. I went through various progressions. I had another type of back saw that I used at first. Then I tried for a while. I used a, a Japanese saw similar to this with dovetailing and had good success. But when I got this, probably 25 years ago, um, when it wasn't even, it had just... It was still the independent saw company. I don't think they have that name on there anymore. Lee Nielsen bought them out uh, and then started making them. Um, the, once I started using this, I was like, oh, man, this is a dream. This is like an old world tool. And you can really cut. Well, those dovetails were cut with this just earlier today, as a matter of fact. So beautiful tool. It's, uh, they're not inexpensive either, but again, it's one of those that you really will enjoy having. You, there are others, like when I have classes here and we know we're going to cut dovetails, I don't say go out and buy the Lee Nielsen, like, just like I wouldn't say go out and buy the Veritas um, chisel. Let's say you can get, uh, there is a Veritas version of back saw that has a molded body. They work really nicely and they're a fraction of the cost. So um, you can look at that one too. I don't, we didn't put a link to that yet, but it's the Veritas one. Um, while I'm thinking of that, we did put a link to another version of chisel rather than this. 
uh, the Swiss made. We put a link to some that have come out, and they're from, I believe, Czechoslovakia. They're the Narex chisels. They're pretty good quality for the price. They're really inexpensive, almost like the marple's inexpensive, but they have pretty decent steel and really good feel. You get a lot of chisel for the money. It's a nice starter set. We did have a link to that just to reflect back on the chisels. And the last little fun bonus one I've got is this. You've heard me talk about this scalpel. I added this to the um, tool cabinet years ago when I was contacted by a um, craft company. And they said, we now have these scalpels available. Would you like to try them out? Yeah, sure. And they sent them along some plastic ones and then this metal one. And the metal one was one by far because it feels so heavy. And they actually are for surgical purposes. But the only difference is they don't sterilize the blade. So you can get sets of these blades. Like the last time I got it, I found 100 of them. Um, but <laughs> and it'll hold me for a while. But you snap them in there. You think? What? You think they'll hold you for a while? <laughs> They're probably in the attic. No, they're not. They're right in my <laughs> drawer, right here. Right where I know where to find them, in this pile in the back. There's five in that little pack right there. And then, <laughs> and then um, there's one right in here. It says non-sterile. So they're made for the craft world. And they realized that a lot of people in craft would enjoy using them. They've got that little, they're extremely sharp, and they've got like a little curve or hook to the end. The hook is about the thickness or the height of skin, the depth of two layers. <laughs> I wonder why. And no, I mean, when you do precise work, a lots of times I use it as a knife, like just to cut something quickly, or uh, in veneer work, inlay work. They're really great, very sturdy. And we did provide a link to my favorite um, blade. You can get a lot of different shaped blades. But this is my favorite basic shape. It's all purpose. The 10A blade shape. You can try all the different ones. And the, the body of it, this is a Swan Morton scalpel. And the best part is that feedback loop that you get when you're using this. Like no matter what you're doing, for that moment in time, you're a surgeon. You're doing surgical work, and it's kind of good. You're like, yeah. And there's no blood. It's yeah. plus. If my wife could see me now, look at this surgical. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So and, then that, I, and then I have a little magnet up here behind this block that holds it right there. I also like my marking knife a lot, but we could talk about that another time. <laughs> so that's it. That was a baker's dozen. I think there ended up being like 13 and some side roads we went down there. I have a few there. questions for you. Okay. How much, David's asking, how much would you spend on three or four rasps files of good quality? <laughs> what was that again? You said to stop me. Rasps? Relish that. Rasps. Um, I, I think you just got to get a good one. I don't know what they cost now. I think they were $50 a piece around there last time I got a rasp, a rasp. $50 a rasp. Okay, Michael's asking, do you oil the saws or soles of the planes before you use them? No, I wax them. I don't oil them. I, that's why this wax is here. I use this paste wax. Any, almost any kind of paste wax will work. But yeah, you definitely want to wax the sole here. And boy, does it make a massive difference when the blade's just lightly exposed, sharp. It just feels like there's no resistance except for the blade slicing beautifully through the surface. Okay, uh, let's see. Tom, uh, David's asking, what is the small combo file you use most often? Um, oh, Dave, good question. I think you mean this one. Um, this is like a little refined file. I think you mean this one. I don't know that we put the link to this, but it's an 8-inch file. It's got a coarse cut over here, and it's flat. 
and then the finer flat here, and then it has the rounded on one side. I do use this a lot, like going right from the rasp, like if you go from the 50, the finer rasp, this will clean that out. So it's almost like going through grits of sandpaper, you know, like when you switch to the next one, you're cleaning up. It'll clean up the cuts faster, you won't have to sand long. And then I card scrape right after that. And you can literally go right to 220 on a palm sander and sand from the card scraper. Or you could make the 150, 180 step before that if you want. But you greatly save time sanding with a fine rasp like this. This gets into those tight places. I used to use this a lot when I was making 18th century chairs and you had the pierced splats, like all those cutouts, and you wanted to get in there, this is almost like leaving a polished, almost leaves a great surface that needs very little sanding. Um, pretty sweet. We can put a link to this too. I know we have a link to Yes, one. I think we do. David's asking the brand of that. Do you remember? I forgot to put the link. I don't have it on here, but we do. We do have the uh, link. We will post the link to it because we, we have done that previously so okay Lu Luce is asking will will slip it work for the sole of the plane yeah uh, slip it is like a surf table surface wax anything like that um, you just don't want to use something that is going to contaminate the wood too much I don't worry about waxing the soles contaminating like if I'm, I'm, I'm gonna plane this drawer side after but I'll always give it a light sanding and I never have any, it's so little wax and it's actually on the plane. You don't really spread it around that much. So you don't want to glob it on there. You're just wiping a very thin film and that'll, yeah, that'll go for a good while. Okay, that's as far as I have one. Awesome, so hey, if you like this content, why not subscribe? It's so easy, Join just hit that little list. button. And, and ring the bell, and <clears throat> also, yeah, join the mailing list to get all the information. We're gonna be coming out some new things. If you're not always checking YouTube, um, the mailing list at epicwoodworking.com is where you wanna be to get all the updates when we have them. Like the letter that's going out tomorrow morning to talk about all those pieces in progress we have at the cheapest prices I've ever shown them, and they're only that much. There's no more. So first come, first serve. So if you want to check those out, uh, yeah, so you can you go ahead. Check them out now. <laughs> uh, yeah, before the letter goes out. Epicwoodworking.com, and you'll see on the right top corner a link to our store, or you can just say epicwoodworking.com slash epic-store, and you'll see them under Made by Tom. That's the category. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for hanging out with us again on this special edition, a Friday edition. You know what? It feels like Friday we the actually... 13th, somebody mentioned. Oh, yeah, Friday Oh, my 13th. goodness, yes. We actually needed two nights. I mean, look, we got another full night in, so it really was more than a single night to really talk about these tools. We got a little sidetracked here and there, but I hope you found that to be good, useful content that you can use to build your hand tool set. So thanks again for hanging out with us. We look forward to seeing you next time right back here on Shop Night Live. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. Have a great weekend, everyone.